University of Maryland School of Medicine and Director of Wound Healing and Metabolism at the R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center. Doctor, thank you for your time. Thank you for having tell me, me. Tell me about Stop the Bleed. Where did this program come from? So Stop the Bleed was a, a really a joint effort of multiple organizations and the federal government. Um, and it really was one of the first programs that really sought to involve the public in um, trying to improve survival from injury. And um, it developed uh, some really simple techniques that we can treat, um, train the public to use um, when there is life-threatening bleeding um, that can uh, improve survival of patients um, to get to the hospital where they can get um, expert care. What's the response from the, the public been like? I mean, people, you know, everybody's learned the Heimlich maneuver and, and CPR and, and hopefully they've learned how to work a defibrillator. Why is this an important part for regular civilians to know? So as, as you heard in the um, segment before, bleeding is still the leading cause of death after injury. So if we want to impact that number and save more lives, the sooner we control bleeding, the better chance we have of saving a patient. So when there is that life-saving hemorrhage, we rely on our professional uh, emergency response people. And as we heard, we have a wonderful um, uh, a sort of, sort of uh, elegant system in the state of Maryland that really goes out and gets you when they know you're injured. But they have to know you're injured and they have to get to you. So there's often a lag between the time of injury and the time that help arrives. And if a bystander who is there at the moment of injury or close thereafter can um, do some simple techniques that will lessen the amount of blood loss, then that gives a patient a much better shot at survival. I think if somebody was in the scouts or, or took a life-saving course, they probably learned about tourniquets. Mm -hmm. Did we learn it right? I, I've heard that maybe there was some, I don't want to say bad info, but the techniques have improved. Well, one of the things that has improved is we have great, better um, uh, tourniquets that are available commercially. Um, they are not super expensive uh, so that you can have your own little stop the bleed kit for about $40 um, where you'll have gloves and gauze and uh, a tourniquet and the things that you might need to help stop, uh, stop the bleed. Uh, so, um, you know, these, these uh, manufactured tourniquets are our best bet. Now, you see on TV a lot of times people taking the belt off or taking right. a scarf and wrapping it around the arm as a, as a method to control hemorrhage. And that looks great on TV, but we know from testing that it doesn't actually stop the bleed well. And in certain circumstances can actually increase the amount of bleeding because you know, think about it, when you get your blood draw, drawn, what, what do we do? We put a tourniquet on your arm to plump up your blood vessels, right. and then we stick a needle in and the blood comes back more freely. So a venous tourniquet is, is what that is, so it's not as tight as the one that we're going to teach you to put on to stop arterial bleeding. So when those are put on, there's no blood it's below really the area. Um, where the tourniquet is placed. Oh, do you want to try it? Not on me. <laughs> Maybe on this thing. Which uh... so I want to start with. The do we first... start with the punctures? Yeah, I want okay. to start with the the first step because your first step is not necessarily to put a tourniquet on. It's really to do some more simple measures, and that more more simple measure is just applying pressure. So that's really the first step. Uh, to, to the actual process of, of stopping the bleed. And it can't be just, oh, I'm putting my, I'm applying pressure. No, I'm not. You have to really apply pressure. Really? So you're leaning into it. You're putting your body weight. You are exhausted after you finish because you're holding pressure. Remember, you have to stop that artery. You're, you're trying to block an artery. And you're trying to prevent the blood from coming out. So applying pressure is the first step. The ste second step, Excuse me, if you have a wound that is deep, as these on these models are, sometimes putting pressure isn't enough, and you literally have to pack the wound with gauze. Or if you don't have gauze, 
this a shirt, any piece of cloth, a scarf, whatever you might have at hand, could be used to pack a wound. Because we're not worried at this point that it's a sterile it's, dressing. We're not worried about it being sterile because if you don't survive to get to the hospital, you don't survive to get an infection. So this is really about saving a life. And all you want to do is put that gauze in to the bottom of the wound and fill it up completely. So you can use gauze, you can use the scarf or a shirt, as I mentioned, or you can use a regular uh, bandage. Um, whatever you have uh, can be utilized. This, this and, is not for the faint of heart. I mean, this, this in, in real life, you know, this person's bleeding badly. Somebody may be concerned about bloodborne illness. Yes. Um, but there's a life to be saved. Yes. And, and, you know, again, most of us don't walk around the streets with our gloves in our pockets. So when it comes to that, you may not have a pair of gloves to put on. One of the things I tell classes that I teach that you could use if you keep them in your bag, you know those terrible plastic bags that the state of Maryland wants us not to use anymore? Those um, T-shirt bags, if you save them like I do and have them in your car, you can stick your hand in that right. and have that at, act as a barrier between you and the blood if you, if you should um, find yourself in this kind of circumstance. Okay, we'll get back to the demo. Good okay. email question from Robert. Um, what should be in trauma kits, uh, first aid kits at public places, schools, workplaces, and right. so forth? I, uh, that's a wonderful uh, question, Robert. I think the things that are, are necessary are gloves, so having gloves so that we can um, protect ourselves as, as we try to help uh, patients. We need some gauze, so it, it doesn't have to be fancy gauze. Now, this is what I call fancy gauze. This has hemostatic agents in it, so it helps the blood to clot faster. Right. But this plain old gauze will work as well. So gauze or um, one of these hemostatic gauze, you'll need some scissors. You will need a marking pen because it's very important to write on the tourniquet the time. If you're going to put a tourniquet on, we want to know what time that tourniquet was placed because there is a limit to the amount of time we want to leave a tourniquet in place before we take it down uh, so that that limb um, uh, won't necessarily uh, require amputation. Do you want to demo the tourniquet? Sure. On uh, our friend here? Are you sure you don't want me to do it on you? <laughs> yes, I, okay. I'm quite sure. I don't even <laughs> like the blood pressure. <laughs> so um, usually we leave the loop in. This tourniquet could be used on an arm or a leg, so it's big enough that it can go on either. So usually you just simply slip the loop through the extremity. You want to assure you place the tourniquet um, between the heart and the wound. So if my injury is here, my heart's here, I want the tourniquet up here, right? right. So you want it away from the wound, but not below it. It has to go on tight. And what, if your patient is conscious, they're not going to like it. They're going to say it hurts. They're going to, they may even scream and holler, but you have to assure them that what you're doing is meant to help. So you want to make it tight. And you know it's tight because you don't want to get, be able to get your finger between right. the uh, tourniquet and the skin. So I've, I've, I've secured it. I've fastened the Velcro down. And then this windlass, which is a key part of the tourniquet that allows you to tighten it even further. And if you look closely, you can see it dimpling in and usually it takes about two turns of the windlass, and then you're gonna lock it there, and then you're gonna bring your uh, Velcro strap over, and then strap this. And this is where you need your marking pen, where you're gonna note the time so that when the patient arrives at the hospital, the hospital personnel will know how long the tourniquet has been in place. How, and you, how, oh, please. And you're gonna know, how do you know you've done a good job? you won't see bleeding, right? So if the bleeding stops, you've done a good job. How do you know this is the right treatment? That, it, that it's a situation, instead of the pressure you demoed that that's not working, we need the tourniquet. So if you're applying pressure and you still see blood dripping on, under your hand, then it's time to, to try something else. Sometimes you'll need to, you, you will need your hands. Maybe if you're 
uh, by yourself, you will need your hands free so that you can go for help or you can uh, do some other maneuver uh, that you may need. So putting a tourniquet allows your hands to be free in, in some way, so has that advantage. But usually you know you need to move on to the next step because um, this is ineffective or maybe you're even getting tired because as I said, yeah. it, you're using energy when you're applying pressure and you do this for 10 minutes, uh, it, you know, you, it, it, may, it may get tiresome. I have about half a minute. You and okay. your colleagues have been taking our friend out here in the community and training groups. Absolutely. How, how long does that take? So the training is about an hour. It's not, it's not a super long. There's a small um, sort of slideshow that we give where we teach, we teach some background about what does life-threatening hemorrhage look like because people often don't know what that looks like. Uh, and, and so we have to sort of, you know, if you see s blood soaking through clothing, if you see it puddling up around a wound, those things are signs that um, there may be life-threatening hemorrhage. Dr. Sharon Henry, pleasure talking with you. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.